Hey, everybody. Welcome to The Daily Objective. And today we're going to be talking about, uh, sadly, one of my heroes in life who let me down. I wanted to be Arnold Schwarzenegger. I, I wanted to be a Terminator. I thought they had the best life. Uh, they don't have to go to school. That was about as far as uh, my reasoning went. But I mean, yeah, I absolutely I've, I've quoted Last Action Hero on this very show at in the past uh nikos lit up over in europe they 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 actually unironically think that's a great movie and um i actually got to become arnold schwarzenegger uh last week i i was on a movie set where i played a badass who goes to rescue a woman in distress i like schwarzenegger i rode a motorcycle and by motorcycle i mean moped and by <laughs> ride i mean i fell off of it <coughs> But the one who really fell off is Arnold Schwarzenegger with some of his recent Instagram posts. So uh, here and here to talk about that with me is a guy who I think would play a better Terminator at this point. I mean, how many times does Schwarzenegger need to beat this uh, this dead horse? He's 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 not right for the part. I think uh, Mark Pellegrino would make a better one. How are you doing? Good, man. And and there's not six degrees of separation between me and Arnold Schwarzenegger. I actually worked with him. In his oh. directorial debut, he directed an episode of Tales from the Crypt, which was a show in the early, uh, late 80s and early 90s that lots of actors did. And I was in his first uh, uh, directed episode. Wow. So that's post-Terminator uh, 1 Schwarzenegger, the, the legend. Wow. Yes. Very yes. cool. Post-Terminator post 1. Maybe Running Man and others, other classics have already uh, came out. Very nice. Wow. Well, that's... That must have been a true honor. I'm sorry he let you down as well with uh, the way he turned out, although um, it's not the first time a Republican governor in California um, let me down, although uh, I'll, I'll, I'll admit the previous one uh, did it before I was born, so I can't really uh, say it bothered me too much. But I'm going to, uh, I guess, read some of these Instagram posts by Arnie, and uh, we'll see what you think, and we'll see what the people at home think please uh super chat we've already got two dollars from mario lean hey listen folks if we're gonna produce the next terminator uh franchise we need your help thank you for the super chat please send much more all right so here's what arnold posted on instagram let me sip my tea real quick because this is gonna suck our country began with the willingness to make personal sacrifices for the collective good it's right there in the closing line of the Declaration of Independence. Quote, we mutually pledge to each or other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. End quote. Almost two centuries later, John F. Kennedy posed his famous challenge. Ask not what your country could do for you. Ask what you can do for your country. Our country became great because every generation before us knew that liberty and duty go hand in hand. I am worried that many of my fellow Americans have now lost sight of that. We need to protect ourselves and win this war. We don't need to close our economies again. We just need to come together like the generations of Americans who came before us and to give just a tiny fraction of what they gave. We need to prove to ourselves and to the world that we can unite to defeat the common enemy. Because trust me, the coronavirus is not the biggest threat we will face this century. What will you do for your country? Oh, that almost sounded like a threat. It's not the biggest threat. Is he planning some kind of cyborg rise up that I didn't hear about? Maybe. It's not so surprising that uh, another Austrian is, is trying to tell us to unite and do, do potentially bad things for the common good. Hey, but wow. why are we surprised by this? He was, he was the, uh, he was the governor elect in California and, uh, and, and didn't do such a hot job. I think people discovered that he was not quote unquote conservative or uh, represented Republican principles at all. So seeing him rant in what I can only describe as a, as a leftist, uh, you know, collectivist uh, rant, it doesn't surprise me at all. Yeah, I remember uh, I was uh, living in Detroit, so I was not uh, his constituent, but I remember seeing him on TV when he was running and then became governor, dropping movie references every five seconds to remind the audience that that they love him, that he's a star. And then 
Uh, he would give a speech like saying, like, I will sell California, like like the job of a governor is to make the state attractive to business and to tourists and stuff, which is a nice thing to want. But it's not a good look. I mean, it's not the way it's supposed to be. The government should properly be delimited to uh, protecting property, protecting rights and then laissez faire. Leave us alone. So to have a governor um, saying, I'm going to you know, sell California like you sell a product. I'm going to make the world and the country want to come here to live and to work and to buy our output. Um, again, reminds us of a certain chancellor. But I mean, but I mean, we're all fascists now in the modern world, I'm sorry to say, in a sense. Like we all see that the government plays a role in the economy. So the problem goes much deeper, much farther back than Arnold. And can and can we and can we just say that the signatories to the Declaration of Independence all signed that contract, all knowingly pledged their uh, honor to a cause, which they also linked to their own survival and lives, not just to this collective nonsense, but it was a contract people knowingly engaged in for the betterment of their own being, for the end of tyranny, uh, not the imposition of tyranny. There was no such thing as a collective to those people at that time. Yes, and uh, what they the what the founders were talking about was nothing like um, what Arnold is asking for. Uh, well, so what is he asking for? He's very vague in that post, but I, I guess he's saying everyone should get vaccinated and basically cooperate. Yeah, I think he's he's saying everyone get vaccinated. Um, so it's it really troubles me, you know, as someone who's generally pro vaccine, you know, to the extent that I have an opinion, I I am bothered seeing the way it's being pushed on people and the way that now I'm seeing Biden talk about, oh, uh, now there's this new vaccine. It's like, I'm totally fine with hearing about a new vaccine that kind of up is like a vaccine 2.0, but I don't want to hear about it from the president. I don't want the governor or the former governor or anyone who's involved with politics telling me about it. I want to hear about it from, you know, from the, uh, from the market. I want experts that are in the private sector to give their best recommendation. And it's uh, very difficult to be objective and to trust a company or a product when the government is pushing it and even hinting that they might force it. And we were seeing overseas uh, the government basically. I mean, well, what am I saying overseas? I mean, we're seeing here in, in, in red states, uh, well, in blue states, there are some measures I'm hearing about where like businesses must require customers to be vaccinated patrons to be vaccinated. And over in the red states, there's some policies that say like a business may not discriminate against the unvaccinated. So in both cases, we've got government uh, imposing their will on private property, which is very disheartening to see. It's very disheartening. And, and the other day in Starbucks, I heard a woman reflecting more or less what I think the zeitgeist is out there. She said, I believe in rights too, but now, understand, folks, when you when you put a butt behind rights, uh, you're invalidating the concept of rights because rights are inviolable. And that means there are no conditions under which you can violate them. You can't violate them in an emergency. You can't violate them for any reason whatsoever. They are inviolable. And anything human beings do to one another must always be within the sphere of rights protection, always. Yeah. And that's what people don't see. And part of the reason they don't see it is because they have a very foggy view of what rights actually are. Are rights uh, the protection of your person and of your speech by the government? Or are rights basically uh, stuff you're entitled to, like a job if you want one, shelter, food, um, not to be offended as another right that they say you have. So because people have such a foggy uh, kind of package dealing of various so-called rights, they're willing to compromise on the legitimate rights, such as property and speech, if it, um, you know, if it, you know, as, as, you know, because they're sort of packaging it with illegitimate ones, like, you know, the right to be given stuff, the right to have your neighbor vaccinated, whether he wants to or not, et cetera. Um, now, how, what, what, what would you say if, if that lady said, well, my neighbor not being vaccinated is endangering me? Uh, how would you answer that? I guess you, you well, I, I, I have answered this with with many mm -hmm. people. Um, and, and I'm saying this as a person who's fully vaccinated. Um, we've we've switched the the onus 
of our uh, obligations to our health onto other people's shoulders. Uh, when in fact, th the responsibility for your health is you. And that means if you, uh, you can choose to be around people who are not vaccinated and take precautions if you have, you know, those secondary, uh, what do they call them, uh, uh, characteristics, whatever, that, that make you more susceptible to the disease. You, you know, you can control how close they get to you. You can control the distances you have between people, who you choose to uh, engage with and who you don't. That's within your control. That doesn't mean you won't get sick, but you can do everything in your power not to. Mm -hmm. And if the market does create an environment where literally people are wearing stickers that say like I'm vaccinated or they won't like literally like a uh, or they're wearing like a wristband where they can't get into uh, malls or airports or whatever it is, unless they have proof that they got vaccinated, if the market and only the market brings that about, it may make people uncomfortable, but that they but they mustn't then compare that to fascism and say, oh, we're living under Nazi rule. It's, it's simply not the case. It, it is very inconvenient to be boycotted by the market, but it is not the same as having force uh, used on you. So people, uh, they, they need to uh, resist the temptation to make the Nazi comparisons when no force is being used. I, th I think it's important that people don't make the connection between the market and choice, but that's what the market is. The market is the aggregate of people choosing. So it's just everybody, it, it, it's the general direction that something goes when a bunch of people are freely choosing. And that's what we have to keep in mind when we talk about the market. It's not some insidious thing that has to be leveled or pushed away or not considered. It, it's, it's the ultimate it's the ultimate forum for human interaction in a free society. Well, what if somebody says, OK, so the store won't sell you food like literally you, they cut off your Internet, they cut off everything like no one will hire you. Like, how can you actually say that, you know, no, that, you know, a private company can do whatever they want. And when and, you know, then they paint this picture where it's like you're basically shunned from all society and you're left to live like an animal without anything because nobody will associate with you. Nobody will do business well, with you. You, it, you can't do what you want, particularly when it jeopardizes other people. And because those people are going to have a say in their, in their own life, in the direction of their own life. And they can certainly choose not to associate with you if they consider you a risk to themselves or to their livelihood in some other way. They're just protecting themselves as opposed to the government, which is protecting some other type of interest, protecting its own power. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whether the government is doing it for power or let's say they really, really care about the issue. If it's inappropriate, if it's not the proper purview of government, it is inherently corrupt and will become multiple types of corruption as a result. It's hard for me to believe that anybody in the government actually cares. And maybe I'm just maybe I'm being prejudiced to some degree, because if, if you think that it's your job to compel people to your will, that's not a caring place. That doesn't come from a caring place or a respectful place for what, what is human life, which is choice and thinking and action on that thinking. If you're, if you're subordinating all of that stuff to what you want, it, it, essentially you don't respect human life at all. Yeah, I guess. Well, some people, I would imagine, go into government in the first place. They go into politics saying, I want to be part of the solution. I want to make the world a better place. But they also have a very foggy view of what rights are and what the job of government is. So they basically they see the government as corrupt and they say, I'm going to go in there and I'm not going to be corrupted. But then they quickly learn to be in politics today is to pick winners and losers. It is to promise things to your constituents and promise things to your uh, campaign donators, and then basically try to balance um, all the favors you promised, as well as new opportunities, as well as actually on some level trying to do the proper job of government. So um, even, pe even if people do enter government with good intentions, hard as that might be to visualize, uh, they soon realize the nature of the lobby system is uh, where you're, you are, uh, it, it's, a, it's a no sum game. It is win, lose or lose, lose. Yeah, we have, a, we have a spoil system democracy now where people get into power and, and they get into power by promising their group that they're going to use the stick that, the, that their group gives them to beat values out of the opposition for them. So it's all about, it's all pro uh, political profiteering now. I hate it when that happens.
excuse me, sadly, that's true. Um, although when, when you do bring up the political class, I do uh, feel like I want to push back and, and ask like tongue in cheek, well, which part of Canada did this political class move here from? Obviously, these are our neighbors. They went to our schools, as, <coughs> as George Carlin used to frame it. These are our, these are our community neighbors. These are our people. They're, they And they represent us when they go to D.C. or to the local government. So you and I don't like what they're doing, but the, but they largely do represent the interests of their voters, sadly. They, they, yes, I, I, the, the, the American people uh, take a part of the blame, a large part of the blame for putting these people in power. But these are people who have decided to make a living by um, stealing values, by, by not producing anything, but by, but by compulsion. And to me, there's something essentially sick in that. Hey, just, just a quick thing, respecting rights. I've had, a, uh, I've had a reality check in the editing bay for a while. My editor was on vacation, but there, there will be one coming out in the next few days on rights specifically. So um, reality stay tuned. check, the YouTube channel. Uh, yes. Everybody go subscribe there or you will be terminated. A couple of super chats. Zalmi with 499 says, how are you? And then some Arnold uh, stuff we don't need to read here on a, in mixed company. Speaking of which, here's Mary Lean with $10 says, my redneck cousins, their description, not mine, are some anti-vax because of government's heavy handedness. More people would get vaccinated if government backed off. That makes sense. This is true. Me. I think the rest of the world looks at us, uh, casts a... Uh, uh, aspersions on us when I actually think that for the most part, this is a very healthy impulse uh, on the part of Americans, uh, even if it's unhealthily expressed and they're just as foggy about the nature of rights as the people on the left. It's that sense of life that's telling them this is wrong. They may not know exactly how or why it's wrong. They just know it's wrong and they're pushing back. And that's great. I agree. And I also don't. I think, uh, let me challenge that after two more super chats. Hugh James with 99 pence and uh, Robert with RON. I don't even know what currency that is, but he, he sent 10 of them. He says, quote, screw your freedom, says another Austrian with a tank. Well, where's the lie, I ask. But um, remember, again, we did, we, did, we, do, we did vote for Schwarzenegger. We do vote for the, for the current. Uh, I should have voted for McClintock. There you go. Um, that must have been an interesting time. You could have voted for Gary Coleman, if I recall. It was just a fascinating, uh, but also shot like uh, dev like shockingly uh, absurd time in politics. Right. That was kind of like the genesis of this freak show we've seen in politics in recent mm. years. I would yeah, I would offer. But um, but let me push back a little bit, because um, I know you see this as a largely positive kind of American sense of life, which. I don't know that you're wrong, but I also know what what do you get with a basically, a, let's say, a good sense of life without a good philosophy and a lot of bad epistemology. You end up in some very dark and harmful places. So the time I've quoted Last Action Hero on the show is the scene where uh, the kid, he, you know, he gets sucked into the movie and then he's telling Arnold in the movie that the bad guy's in that house. Go, go, go get him. And Arnold goes, this is amazing. I went to school to be a cop for all those years, studying various investigation and criminal psychology. And all it took this whole time was just to drive around the block, park in front of the house and say, there he is in there. So it, the point being here that uh, the arbitrary is worse than a falsehood. It, the arbitrary is as bad as it can get, I think. And that's basically what we're seeing. Someone can just arbitrarily say, no, the vaccine is actually going to kill you. And people run with it. People can just say, oh, uh, the government is a puppet master and uh, the companies paid them and and because and we're pulling out of Afghanistan now because the companies uh, they're making now so much money from the vaccine. They don't need money from the poppy seeds in Afghanistan anymore. Like just literally people make shit up and people just go, yep, yep, that's it. The killer's in the house. There it is. So the arbitrary when people are following the arbitrary to me. We are in really bad shape. That is why we're in the Tower of Babel. And it ends up making Republicans uh i don't know not an, not friends of of reason in my view certainly they're they're every day passing day they look less and less like allies of mine uh indeed so. and, and same same here i think the like like what i was implying was the impulse itself reveals something very positive unfortunately they're going off in their own in their own direction which i think is very negative 
but at least m many of their conspiracy theories don't have wide purchase in the culture. They don't have institutional capture. We can't say the same thing about the left's conspiracy theories and insanities. I mean, right now we're being driven off the cliff by the left's in insane uh, perspective about uh, climate change, about about uh, this disease, even as as dangerous and as real a threat as it as it really is. But their hyperbole is what is driving the other side to the hysteria in their own right. You know, that right, rightly, the people on the right don't trust the media establishment. They suspect that they have an agenda that there is more important than the truth. Why? Because specifically for the last four years, they've demonstrated uh, uh, an almost uh, a, 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 a unbroken capacity for for telling a lie for for and and so now nobody trusts them they've lost they've lost the uh the ear of the of the opposition at the very least but most people i think look at media now as with a jaundiced eye yes but uh, yes and uh i'm afraid to see some of the media that people are trusting um so i've long been critical of this alternative media we've seen spring up i mean it's a nice idea that you know us enemies of the state or us rebels, we're, we're, we're conversing, we're communicating in secret to get to, to bypass the establishment media. It's a nice idea, make a nice, great 80s action movie. But, um, but wh what are we actually getting? I'm seeing yeah. something even more topsy-turvy than CNN. Yeah, don't right? go from Don Lemon to Alex Jones, go from Don Lemon to Yaron Brook, and there will be a world of difference. Yeah. And even with Yaron Brook or objectivists, you know, they need to um, give their opinion, which they're able to do. But to actually report the facts becomes very difficult, even for them, because where are they getting this information from? It's, it's become basically impossible to verify uh, who's literally re just reporting what is. So it's a uh, it's a sad state of affairs, which is all the more reason uh, for people to follow their own selfish endeavors, their selfish pursuits, uh, for people <coughs> to choose their personal values and to follow them. Um, so, you know, we're, it, it, before I think we were able to change anyone's opinions on what rights are and the government's role in protecting them, we need people to be more selfish. We need people to really be looking at the world and, and asking, how can I get the best life as a whole available to me? And from there, I think more will follow. And one of the ways to uh, pursue your values, I might add, is to support the Ayn Rand Center UK. Please, everybody, uh, consider becoming a member and uh, help this thing grow and also get your own selfish access to exclusive content. Uh, thanks for the super chats, folks. I guess we're, uh, we're about ready to call it a wrap. Um, so coming up later today, I've got um boot we've got boot camp at eight o'clock uk that's for members only boot camp with don watkins i believe Ooh, if you think uh if all of you armchair philosophers think you know what you're talking about you think you're a good communicator wait till uh don watkins uh gives you uh a piece of his mind thank you action jackson for the five dollars he says should facebook twitter etc purge anti-vaxxers why or why not well there's a topic that could make its own episode if not multiple episodes um, I mean, good question. I'm glad it's not my decision is my first answer. Second answer is I'm sympathetic to the fact that they do. I know that'll piss off a lot of people, but I, I'm sympathetic to them purging misinformation. And I know some of that misinformation turns out to actually be true, but I'm sympathetic to where they're coming from. Get mad, everybody. Stay mad if you like. I'm living the good life. Thank you, Emma, for the 449 Pen, uh, pounds. Mark, what do you think about Facebook and Twitter purging uh, anti-vaxxer content? Yeah, you know, I have the same unpopular opinion. Uh, that's their right to do that. And of course, they, they make errors. And, and maybe they're, they're, the, the prism through which they judge these things isn't uh, exactly objective, but it's their property and I'm using it and I get a lot out of it. So, uh, you know, let, let the market be the answer to that. And I wish the market would work faster sometimes. I wish more alternatives would come up sooner. I wish Silicon Valley had a wonderful philosophy to go with their wonderful technology. Believe me, I've, I've suffered uh, because of their incompetence and stupidity. Um, uh, but in the non-super chat, Ashley says, aren't you alternative media? 
Yes, indeed. No! <laughs> what have I become? Well, that's why we're going to end the show. And thank you, Marilyn, for the $2. She says it's their platform. Exactly right. Uh, thank you, everyone, for the super chat. So also, so coming up at 8 o'clock, we've got boot camp for members only. But for all the non-members as well, we've got Life on Earth at 10 o'clock UK time, whatever that means to you, uh, here on YouTube and, of course, on Clubhouse. Now, we're going to be jumping over to Clubhouse right now. Uh, don't forget, everybody, tomorrow is TV Talk, the hot new show that everybody loves, season four of Mad Men. I'm a season behind, I'm sorry to say. I fell behind on watching the show, so uh, oh, I'm watching... Great. You're missing a you're missing a, a a huge Don Draper decline in in season four, and it's quite mm -hmm. interesting. I'm 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 looking forward to that. Right now, I'm almost done with season three, but I wanted to ask um, regarding season two. You know that character Jimmy Barrett, the comedian with the loud mouth. Yeah. Does he remind you of a particular anarchist that had you on his show not long ago? Oh, you um. Wow. Uh, okay. Maybe on steroids. <laughs> okay. He just, his look and his delivery style, his outrageous. Anyway, uh, we're talking about Michael Malice, uh, who I, you know, who I'm, I'm friends with, you know, I don't, uh, I don't, I know, I know, uh, there was a lot of bad things said about Jimmy Barrett, but just the, uh, the persona definitely reminds me, uh, Rosy says no TV talk tomorrow. Jack Schumann in the, in the chat says, Rucka, we're canceled tomorrow. We're postponed tomorrow. Well, which is it? Uh, okay, no. so so they know better than I. I, I, have, I have a photo shoot. I have a photo shoot and a Showtime commitment. So I, I'm out, but I thought they might do it. So you'll be back on August 27th, a week from tomorrow. So that gives me and many of you time to binge on Mad Men and get all caught up. So I'm looking for that. Looking forward to that. You're going to be discussing season four and five, which completely invalidates the idea of me catching up easily so <laughs> but anyway i'm glad you're actually speeding it up so i'm not alienated from watching the show live for that long so yeah that's good uh anyway enough uh filibustering here let's end the show looking forward oh, wait uh, wait also there might be a change to format we have to discuss it with rosie and i have to discuss it with, with uh, jackson jennifer but we may end up just doing whole shows so more digestible material you know when there's only been maybe uh, two seasons or something so everybody can digest it and then we can talk about the whole show as opposed to doing a season per episode which I think carries things out a little bit far yeah that's what you did with like Fleabag for example but yeah. with, because Mad Men is so long you went you made it a season per episode but it ended up alienating someone like me who still couldn't keep, catch up stay yeah, caught up so it's a lot but it looks like now they're doing double season like double uh, two seasons per episode so before you know it you'll be back to uh do a format that I can easily follow. Sure. In any case, TV talk, folks, that's, that's a show that I enjoy. And so do you. So uh, that's coming up to uh, not tomorrow, but a week from tomorrow. And the daily objective is on tomorrow as well. Can I announce the guest? I don't know if I can. Actually, we can because it's already on YouTube. Tal Safani. Looking forward to that. That's tomorrow. Same time. Jumping over to Clubhouse now. See you all there or you will be terminated. Thank you all. And goodbye.